Now, I would reckon that there can be very few of us living in this country who are not familiar with a statue that stands on the top of the dome of London's Central Criminal Court, uh, affectionately known as the Old Bailey. The name of this statue is in fact Lady Justice and you'll be aware she's shown as standing on the globe and holding an upright sword in her right hand and the balanced scales of justice in her left. And the intended message of the imagery is not too difficult to understand. The scales are symbolizing the weighing of the prosecution and defense and the sword symbolizes the authority and the swiftness and finality of justice. And the toga she's wearing allegedly represents civilization. Well, fascinating as this subject may be, we are also aware today that the removal of inappropriate statues has become something of the latest trend amongst some folk. Some might well think that in the light of the present notions and indeed practice of justice so-called, that the time has now come for a reassessment of the appropriateness of this particular statue uh, above the courts in London. Perhaps some would think that the sword should now be replaced with a feather duster and the scales with a broken balance. I'm sure that many listening to this today might have felt for years that British justice has been reduced to the level of the nearly farcical. More particularly though, some might be wondering, well, why am I beginning an exposition of Bible text by referring to these things? Well, my reasoning is because the scriptures direct us to this particular subject. Now, I've not mentioned these things this morning, uh, merely because they are topical, of course, but because they are central to the subject matter that is being presented to us here in the Gospel of Mark. You may recall that we had been working our way for a series in the Gospel of Mark, and we're returning to this. So we come now to the 15th chapter of Mark's Gospel, and particularly verse 27. And the scene set before us is a very somber scene. It's the place where the death penalty was administered, Golgotha. And we read there in that 27th verse that with the Lord Jesus, they also crucified two robbers. We remember that robbers, of course, would often make sure that their victims were unable to live to tell the tale. And I want us to consider that as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ and him crucified, that first of all, we see here God's verdict upon sin. As God's verdict upon all sin and God's verdict upon my sin and your sin. And, and then secondly, that we see here the believer's constant supply of strength for the whole of our Christian lives. First of all then, the, uh, the gospel narrative brings us to this somber place of public execution. And we have set before us in plain and uncompromising terms, God's verdict against our sin. We remember that Jesus is not here, as it were, in a private capacity. Had that been the case, he could easily have argued and confounded every one of the, his adversaries who had sought his death. But he's not there as a private person. And so we have to face the question, well, why is he at this dreadful place and in this dreadful situation? Well, we know that he is there as the 
divinely appointed sin bearer. He is the suffering servant of Yahweh. He is there as the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And from the Garden of Gethsemane onwards, we see Jesus now presented to us as the one who bears our iniquities and who makes his soul an offering for sin. From that point on, we see him being led as a lamb to the slaughter, as the prophet puts it. And as we see Jesus here, we are aware that he must soon die on that cross. So we have to remind ourselves he dies as the representative of the substitute, the standing for his people. And by his death, we are reminded of, well, what are we reminded of? We're reminded of the penalty that God has pronounced against our sin. Way back in the Old Testament, God had said that the soul that sins shall die. And the apostle takes that same theme and says with the utmost clarity that the wages of sin is death. Now I guess that we are familiar with these solemn truths. But it's at the cross in particular that we find God's verdict upon sin most clearly and plainly or starkly revealed. The Lord Jesus was and is the Son of the Father's love. Remember the voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And it is as true here at Golgotha as it was at the Mount of Transfiguration. But, and here's a reminder, such is God's just and holy hatred of sin, that it must always be dealt with in terms of strict justice, and therefore it must be punished. And yes, even when his own dearly loved son is carrying the sins of others, he must pay the penalty, and he must pay the penalty in full. Now, I remember some years ago, this does date me rather, but there you are, <coughs> some years ago, Princess Anne, stopped a second time for speeding and that she was let off again with a caution. I doubt if many motorists here who have been caught speeding have had that privilege but I'm sure that she was given that special treatment because of her relationship to the sovereign. I mention that because there are no special favours here for the Lord Jesus. God's holiness and justice are such that he always abhors sin. His justice is inflexible on this subject. <clears throat> the justice of God is never going to be swayed or bent or perverted in any way. It never wavers from its course. All sin will be accounted for in one way or another. We remember, this God is the one who, we're told, did not spare, did not spare his own son, but delivered him up. And if Jesus isn't let off the hook of God's justice, we're well, certainly that no one else should uh, expect that God should uh, water down the cause of justice, in their case, either. Now, the words of verse 24 proclaim with unmistakable clarity God's verdict on sin. Mark doesn't take us uh, this far to tell us that he gets a last-minute reprieve. There's some intervention. Uh, uh, angel hosts come and appear on his behalf. Or that some alternative, as a result of the son's obedience, is suddenly provided. No, we read that astonishing but brief statement, then they crucified him. 
then they crucified him. It is astonishing sometimes how much truth is compressed into such small phrases in the scripture. <clears throat> when we look up at the sky at night and we see something of that incomprehensible vastness of the universe, and that's only the bit we can see, but remember that the Genesis record compresses it all into that one brief statement, he made the stars also. And here in this 24th verse is something of that magnitude, or we should say something even greater. They crucified him. It's the God-man, God manifested in the flesh. And sinful men and women were involved in his crucifixion. And when we read these words, we left in no doubt whatever concerning the fact that God is, always is, a just and a holy being. And there's no way in which he can just forget, overlook our sins and remain the just God and the holy God. So the cross says, in the most clear words, a penalty must be paid. A penalty will be paid, and it has been paid, and paid in full for all those who will receive it. We do well here to remind ourselves uh, that there are those who are unsaved round about us. And the scripture addresses this. You might remember that when the Apostle Paul begins to explain and unfold the whole purpose of the gospel and what it really is all about and why Jesus had to die. Well, when he's writing to Roman Christians about the gospel and what the gospel is, in chapter 1 of the book of Romans, and verse 18, he begins with these words. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, no doubt today there would be those who uh, would criticise Paul for, for being so negative, but he persists and he insists. Where is that wrath of God revealed? Where is it seen in its most stark and dreadful form? Well, it's seen in this, in the fact that he did not spare his own son, Hence Mark's words, then they crucified him. Then they crucified him. <clears throat> but let's add to this and do so from the verses before. Let us add that the son did not spare himself either. There is a total harmony an agreement between the attitude of the father and of the son towards sin and guilt and shame. We're told concerning our sin bearer that he despised the shame. That's the shame of being accounted as a sinner. He despised the shame when he was bearing his people's sins. His holy nature burns with a, a white hot intensity of heat against every violation of holiness. It's repugnant to his very nature. Imagine, if you will, that you're brought into a place, say a place of public worship or where you might be out to eat, and here the wino is brought in. You know the tramp? You know he is coming to the room because of the foul odour. And he's been sleeping rough and hasn't washed for weeks. Would you willingly take his coat on you and wrap it round you and embrace it? You would recoil in horror if he loathsome to you. Well, that, in some small measure, starts to show us what it means for the Lord Jesus Christ to take our sin upon himself. There are those who think they can drive a wedge between 
the Father and the Son between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. But they are wrong. There is total unity and agreement and consistency for the whole of Scripture on this matter. And as we see the Son going to the cross and willingly submitting himself to become that sin bearer of his people, we see in every detail <coughs> that the Son also believes that the justice of God must be satisfied and that a full and complete atonement must be made. In other words, he's saying that there can be no shortcuts, no quick fixes, no special favours concerning this matter. We have an indication of this, and we can't deal with it all thoroughly this morning, but just in brief, <clears throat> it was Jesus himself throughout his ministry who spoke most clearly and more frequently and more powerfully on the fact that the penalty of sin meant suffering and punishment. It's from his gracious lips, uh, uh, that one who was full of grace and truth, we learn from him the account of a rich man. Where? In torments in hell. Christ's words. And <clears throat> he pleads that Lazarus may come with a drop of water and call my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. And just as there was no relief for the lost in hell, and, and, of course, there's no purgatory, no eventual release date, absolutely no hope at all in that place. Neither would the Son seek to reduce or minimise the penalty that God's justice demanded when he himself was the sin bearer. You may have noticed in verse 23 that they gave him sour wine mingled with myrrh to drink. Now, the exact concoction is uncertain. Some uh, have suggested that the wine would be uh, very strong and perhaps with herbs mixed in with it, to, intended to deadening the effects of the pain. But we notice there that we're told very clearly he would not drink. There are Jewish writings that make it clear that it was a custom to give those who are going to suffer this slow and lingering torment of death by crucifixion, to give them a drink of wine mixed with other substances in order to stupefy them. Uh, in other words, to dull their senses, rather like say, the old naval tradition of giving rum to an injured sailor before surgery. But we notice Mark's purpose in mentioning this little detail is significant. He does so in order that we should take note of its refusal and of its rejection. In other words, Jesus would not lessen the bitterness of the sufferings and death that he has to endure as he pays the penalty for sin. It must be paid and must be paid in full. In other words, we do not have an anaesthetized atonement. We don't have a suffering servant who avoids the suffering. If someone is going to pay a debt for us, it must be paid in full before we can be discharged from it. And surely this refusal uh, here uh, to lessen his own sufferings is also saying and agreeing with the fact that every part of the penalty for sin, for your sin and my sin, must be paid and must be paid completely. And just as there was no relief to be found uh, in hell for the rich man, neither would Jesus be relieved from the hell of sin's just penalty on the cross. He is in total agreement that the price for sin must be paid, and it must be paid in full. You may know, parents will recognise this when a child wants to have its own way. Uh, they might get a refusal from mother. Uh, <clears throat> and so 
they will try and get a different response from dad because well especially if it's a daughter or he's a soft touch but when it comes to the father and the son in the work of salvation they both say the same thing to us <clears throat> and they, they say here in these verses that sin must be dealt with there's no exceptions there's no loophole no amount of good works special effects uh, a special relationship perhaps with parents or christians or of going to church or that i'm not as bad as others no special category because of the country you're born in or rituals you've gone through or been put through as a baby and so on no special treatment for anybody outside of jesus christ unless our sins have been dealt with in jesus christ and unless we are found trusting and relying on him and him alone as the one who paid the penalty for my sin and paid for it in full, then the only alternative is that I must pay for them myself. And the point of the gospel is surely that we, you and I, can avoid this. And as a way of peace and pardon and a way for us to be sure that our sins have been put away that's the message of the cross we trust in that the penalty i deserve has been paid and there's nothing left over the slate is wiped clean with the blood of the lord jesus christ but i want us to conclude this morning by seeing secondly that this message of the cross is to be a continual support and indeed encouragement for believers it's not only that we see the tender, willing love of the Saviour and the Father's love for sinners in providing such a way of pardon. The cost was immense for them both. The cross continually serves to support us throughout the whole of our Christian life and walk. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, we had in our reading, Paul makes this remarkable statement concerning the message of the cross. What is the message? It is foolishness to those who are perishing. But notice how he continues. And notice in particular the tense that he uses. It doesn't read, unto us who are being saved, it was the power of God but rather he says this unto us who are being saved it is the power of God it is when we're converted and it continues to be the power of God to us through the whole of the Christian life not something we experience only when we are first awakened and brought into the kingdom of God but that it is the continuous power that is at work in the believer's life so there's, there's a now and there's an always element to it if you look at paul's letters and peter's as well you'll find that they are uh, full of, of the subject of the sufferings and death of the lord jesus christ it was though he thought that even the most mature and spiritual christians could never see too much of the cross or stop learning from its message and implications when we ask the question well what was the source of paul's own zeal of his uh, remarkable patience of his strength how was it that he could uh, repeatedly stand up to beatings imprisonments to hunger to shipwreck and so on what was the power that enabled him to carry on and to live the life that he lived? Well, we're given the answer to this question. Let's hear Paul's own testimony on the subject. And he writes this, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see the source of his strength the Son of God who gave himself for me. Jesus uh, Christ and him crucified. Now this could be the epitaph 
uh, we fixed on Paul's gravestone, if, if we could find where it was. The, the motivating power of his life is summarised in those words. And what he had worked out in his own experience for himself and been learning to do throughout his life, well, he sought to bring this to others in his letters. Now, if <clears throat> you and I went to the doctor with some ailment, you got tennis elbow or something, and he prescribed you a particular medicine, you'd no, and it was effective, you'd be no doubt surprised if the next time you went, say, with a headache or something else, you'd be a little bit surprised if he prescribed the same medicine yet again. And when you get to talking about your various illnesses, and of course, as you get older, it seems to be all about all we do talk about, but when you get to talking with your friends or your neighbours, you find that the same doctor uses the same medicine for him or for her, and, and she's got completely different symptoms, she's got bunions or bronchitis or whatever. And as you talk amongst your friends and so on, you find that no matter what uh, symptoms you have, this doctor always prescribes the same cure. Now, <clears throat> uh, of course, there are those in the medical world who think, well, this, this chap's a quack. And uh, except for one thing, his cures always work. They never fail. You go down to see your doctor, you say to him, why is it that no matter what sim the symptoms of a particular ailment are, you always prescribe the same medicine? <clears throat> and he replies, well, I've made the discovery. I'll share this with you. All this sickness and all this disease all come from one particular source. And it's an important breakthrough in modern medicine because I've been able to identify the very root and cause of all ailments. And because of that, I've been able to make this uh, special medicine, this panacea. It's a universal remedy for every differing symptom. Well, that's living in the realm of fantasy, isn't it? But I would suggest, though, that this is the substance of Paul's spiritual experience concerning the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. For him, there's one disease, which is sin, and he might have many symptoms, but he says this over and over again, and all the New Testament writers agree with him, there is only one sure remedy. His point is this. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What remedy is he going to apply to this situation? The possibility of friction and divisions in the church? Here's the issue he raises. Was Paul crucified for you? In other words, remember the one who was crucified for you Remember the Saviour who died to make you one body in him. And he dies for that one who is his bride for the church. A very practical example here is applying the cross to that whole issue of divisions in, in the body. Let's take another uh, practical example. In dangerous territory, aren't we, being practical? <clears throat> another example in the work place. You may not be treated very fairly. You may not be treated fairly because you're a Christian. But then was Jesus Christ treated fairly? No, he wasn't. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 23, you were bought at a price. What was the price? It was the cross, the penalty that he paid for sin. Do not become slaves of men. You belong to to the Lord Jesus, first and foremost, you were purchased. He said, you were bought. A penalty was paid for you. And <clears throat> so you have to have this in mind when you're even when you're ill-treated and to get your rights in the workplace. In the great conflict, 
which Christians go through, the, the conflict concerning holy living. Again, Paul says, remember the cross. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, you were bought at a price. What are the consequences of this? How should you respond to us? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't belong to yourself. You and I don't belong to ourselves. We've been purchased. We're under new ownership. We've been taken over, thankfully. Let the cross then be as an incentive, incentive in that conflict, in that warfare for you. Another one might be saying, well, I'm finding the Christian life to be difficult. Not just difficult, but too difficult. And, you know, frankly, I'm tempted to give up. Well, remember your conflict with sin is nowhere as near as was the Saviour's conflict upon the cross. Writing to Hebrew believers, the author says this, you, this is Hebrews 12 verse 4, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Remember, you see, Jesus did. He shed his own blood for sinners. Here's an incentive and encouragement to continue. Are you being persecuted and ridiculed because you are a Christian? Peter comes up with exactly the same remedy. So it's not Paul alone. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. In other words, remember Christ's sufferings. Remember Jesus at the cross being cruelly treated and suffering. And see that your trial shows how closely you are identified with him and with his death gets a bit uh, more close to home now and a bit more personal. Are there difficulties in a Christian marriage? Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Let the Saviour's sacrificial dying love become your role model. Remember at the cross, it was death for the blind. This is the thing which was uppermost on his heart and on his mind. And some might say, well, this is, uh, as it were, uh, aiming at the moon in order to shoot over a bush. Uh, and yes, it is, in a sense. But we remember Paul's writing this at a time and a cultural background where women were so often just treated as little better than slaves and personal belongings, chattels. And there is in the gospel this whole fact that there is this, uh, the undertones of the emancipation liberation of women and you ought to remember that if you're a husband purchased with the blood of the lord jesus christ the same is true of the one who god has given to you uh, to be your wife and yes that might involve chocolates and flowers and special treats at least i have the women on side with that uh, <clears throat> perhaps you may be feeling lonely and isolated as a christian think of the cross and that uh, we're told in Ephesians 2 verse 13, in Jesus Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So feed your discouraged faith on this. You might not be near to others. You might feel yourself increasingly cut off, and perhaps some are feeling that at the moment. But we need to remember the blood of Christ brings us near uh, to God. That's the purpose of nearer to God through this. Remember the cross. Are we feeling the daily defilement of our sin and our guilt? Has Satan been accusing us and convinced us uh, that we really are the chief of sinners? Or well, let us remind ourselves again of the cross and that in the words of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin.
Effectively, we can say to Satan, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. We have a remedy against your accusations. And my Saviour knows all about my sins. And I don't need your unhelpful reminders. The Saviour took my penalty and paid for it in full. Do we find ourselves, with ourselves that the onslaughts of Satan make us despair of our ever reaching heaven? Well, doubtless, there are those around the throne, right at this very moment, who once felt that same uh, thing in their own minds and hearts. But what do we read? We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, they overcame him. How? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So no matter what our need may be, or our particular condition, we're to bring it to the foot of the cross. That universal panacea for every spiritual woe or difficulty. Whether it be to encourage or challenge or to stir ourselves up. See that a situation in the light of his suffering and of his death and of his accomplishment and of the glorious hope that he opens up before it and the rest we put into its right shape and perspective for us and it's with this in mind that we turn to our hymn books again as we conclude this part of our worship we, we turn to the hymn number 226 we sing the praise of him who died, of him who died upon the cross. Verse 3, the cross, it takes our guilt away. It holds the fainting spirit up. It cheers with hope the gloomy day and sweetens every bitter cup. And the hymn goes on to apply the glorious truths of the Saviour's sufferings and death for us. Hymn number 226.